All right. This whole presentation, we're mostly going to be discussing vegetables that are directly sown by seed into the garden. So I'm not really going to be discussing things that we transplant into the garden, but we're going to be looking at some of those warm season vegetables that we plant directly by seeds into the garden. Now, I know the next couple of nights are going to be interesting, and I'm going to answer some of those questions after I finish recording regarding the freeze. If you've not been to this website, I want to encourage you to go to this website. This is uthort.com, and it's basically the University of Tennessee horticulture website for all things that are research-based. And what's great about it, whenever you click on educational resources, you can click on that and you can actually scroll down. So there's a lot of different tiles you can select from trees and shrubs, vegetables, to fruits, to backyard wildlife. So whatever you're interested in, especially if you're looking for stuff that's geared more for Tennessee, because anytime you try to Google something, you're going to get recommendations that are not research-based. You're going to get recommendations from other states that really don't work out well in Tennessee, especially when we look at some of the varieties. Some varieties of, of fruit trees, for example, don't grow well in Tennessee, but this website will kind of help guide you on the which ones actually grow well in Tennessee. When we're looking at warm season vegetables, I'm basically going to not be discussing anything that's in the brassica family, which are things like lettuce, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and then all the different greens. Now, lettuce is not in the brassica family, but all the coal crops are, and then all the leafy greens. A lot of these things prefer cooler temperatures, and they can handle frost, a light frost. The things that we're going to be discussing today are things that cannot handle a frost. Ideally, they want the soil temperatures to be between 60 and 70 degrees. And if you were to go take a soil thermometer outside and actually look to see what the soil temperature is right now, it's probably not anywhere near 60 degrees. But it, it might have been a week or two ago. And I think I want to make that point clear that the atmospheric temperature is different from the soil temperature. So the seeds, when we plant them into the ground to actually start growing, they do not care what the atmospheric temperature is. What they care about is what the temperature is directly next to them in the soil. So if you can go to Amazon, you can buy some at some of the box stores. They, can, they have soil temperatures, so you can actually see what the temperature is. But for all the things we're discussing today, 60 degrees minimum, 70 would be better to help improve germination. When we're looking at some of these other things, it's typically early to mid-May, and whenever I start working on this presentation, we see most things planted right after tax day. But this year has kind of been an anomaly of a year, so typically any time from early to mid-May, check your soil temperatures if you can. Also, learn about spacing and growing requirements for these plants. So like that plant on the side there, the pumpkins, pumpkin vines can get anywhere from 8, 10, 12 feet long. And sometimes we see pumpkins growing in some of the smallest little areas in raised gardens. And ideally, they really shouldn't be there to begin with. They need to be in an area where they have room to kind of sprawl out all over the place. So we need to learn some of these crops before we actually plant them. How big does a pumpkin vine get? How big does a watermelon vine get? So we can kind of look at some of these things before we plant them, you know, a foot away from a tomato. And I think this year we're seeing a lot of new gardeners. I'm afraid we're going to see some, some people turn away from gardening because we don't research on, on how big some of these vegetables are actually going to get. The main requirement for growing anything from seed, warm season vegetable wise, is that you've got to have well drained soil. Now the easiest way to tell if you've got well drained soil is to go dig a hole, as, as, if this is in the ground, not as opposed to a raised bed. Go to the ground and dig a hole a foot deep, a foot wide, perfectly round. Fill it full of water. If that water drains out over 24 hours, you pretty much have well-drained soil. Now, I know if I say clay soil, most of us has clay in our soil, but it's not completely poorly drained or somewhat poorly drained. It still has the ability to drain. But just go dig a hole wherever you think your garden may be and make sure that it's actually well-drained because if seeds sit in the ground and they're wet and they're cold, they're going to rot. And 
sometimes people will say, you know, I planted these seeds the first or second week of April. Nothing's been there for a month and a half. Now, there, are, there could have been bugs or could have been squirrels, depending on what it was. But sometimes it just rots if the ground is wet and the ground is cold. So kind of do that. You can also see right now, because it's raining outside my window, I could go look in lower spots in my yard where I think I want to have a garden and say, if, if it rains, you know, as much as we've gotten over the past couple of weeks and, and water is still sitting there, it's probably not a good place to put a vegetable garden to begin with. Now, on a lot of these that I'm going to be discussing today, you can buy transplants. Now, you can go to the various garden centers, box stores, the co-ops, and you can see vegetable plants for sale, and you can see squash, cucumbers, watermelons. I've seen pumpkins, cantaloupes. You can see all these as transplants. Now, there are pros and cons to buying transplants. If the transplants look healthy, they're not leggy, they don't actually have any model leaves, they don't have any bugs, they'll be fine. Sometimes on the transplants, on the squashes and the cucumbers, they can be gentle at the base of the ground where the seed comes up. So if we actually try to pull them up and they kind of twined into some other cucumber plants next to it, we can break that. And whenever we get it home, it doesn't actually grow right because we broke it off at the base of the ground. So if you are buying transplants, it's good to find them that they're fresh, they look like they're new and they've not been sitting there for a month and a half kind of stressed out. Also, look at those transplants for bugs. Now, I, I hope some of you, whenever you go to the garden centers, the box store, you look for bugs on your plants and, and you make sure you're not bringing those bugs home with you. When we talk about fertilizing, now, I don't really make any recommendations generally without knowing what a soil test result actually says. A lot of the soils in Tennessee, we do have clay. And what clay is also good at, it's good at holding phosphorus, it's good at holding potassium, it's good at holding calcium, and it's really good at holding a lot of these new micronutrients. So sometimes we think we need to over fertilize our soil when our soil itself is, is rich enough anyways. Generally, a lot of the soil test recommendations that we see are just nitrogen because nitrogen moves through the soil so easily. And whenever we're growing things from seeds in the garden, the number one problem that they have, that they struggle with, is that the weed seeds will actually take over where your young germinating seeds are taking over. And crabgrass is always an issue because crabgrass, crabgrass germinates when light hits it. So anytime you turn the soil and sun is actually hitting bare soil, from what I've seen, the number one grass that comes back is crabgrass because the seeds are everywhere in the soil to begin with. So if you go through and break open a trench to plant bean seeds or corn seeds and you cover it back up, crabgrass is going to generally come back over that. And sometimes it can get so thick that the corn or the beans or the watermelon will not be able to come up through it. Now, I know gardening is it's mostly like 90% weed control, but this is really important whenever they're actually starting out. Whenever they get larger and they kind of get some feet under them, it's less of an issue. I kind of broke this down and I started with beans and we're going to go all the warm season vegetables that are transplanted from seeds all the way down to watermelons. Now we've got a lot of various beans in the world. We've got bush ones, we've got pole ones. So the bush ones typically run anywhere from 18 to 24 inches tall. We generally call them determinate beans because they will usually put on a flush of beans, a heavy flush at one time. So if you were a person who likes to can or put up a lot of your beans, a lot of people prefer the, the bush ones because they have a heavy fruit set at one time. And we also see that in the ways of tomatoes also. Tomatoes have a determinate variety. They typically, for canning people like Romas, celebrities, those are determinate varieties of tomatoes. And those generally will put on a heavy fruit set at one time, but they will sporadically bloom off and on until frost hits them. Now, the other main branch of, of beans are the pole beans. They need to have some type of a structure to run on. And what's great, we've seen it, and I've got a picture here in just a second. We see people using the old cattle panels, you can actually use wire cages. We see people using everything, but they need something to run on. But we do have some beans that are considered half runners. So you may see at the, at the co-op a pack of seeds called mountain half runner. So they can generally be on the ground or they can be staked up to, 
to be a, a, a pole type bean also. But beans can also be broken down into edamames, which uh, we also know sometimes is like a soybeans, lima beans, dry beans, snap beans. And like all of these kind of have their own varieties. So whenever I say beans, beans have been one of the most cultivated crops around the world for many, many generations. And each generation kind of has their own beans that they've used for years and years and years. I would venture to say there's probably thousands of varieties of beans. And a lot of families, I know like my families, they each have their own specific ones that they are very particular about growing. Like my mother will only grow one variety of bean. And I'll tell you that whenever we go to the variety section. So my mother and my aunt have a huge garden together. They agree on everything, but the one thing they do not agree on is beans. My aunt prefers a pole bean called McCaslin, and it's an older bean. My mother prefers a bush bean called Roma, too. So everybody has their own varieties, and I want, I want to encourage you to trial some of the different ones that you're uh, at, at your house, or maybe some of your family's got some. You may try out a new variety to see if you're going to discover a new family favorite. On beans, generally, it's one inch to one and a half inches deep two to six inches wide on spacing of the plants and three to four feet between rows. Now, if you're staking them for pole beans, it's going to be a little bit different on some of those. Now, this was Rose Skaggs's a couple years ago. These were some pole beans just to kind of show you how tall pole beans can actually get in the landscape. This was probably eight or nine feet tall. It might have actually been closer to 10 feet, but we see pole beans used uh, in tunnels, I've seen people take the cattle panels that are 16 feet long and then kind of drape them over like a giant U and have pole beans running all the way up 16 feet over this cattle panel. They, they really will run if you let them. When we're looking at, at bush beans and pole beans, here's some of the varieties that have kind of been recommended in Tennessee over the years. Bush beans, and a lot of these you've probably grown before, Provider, J2, Blue Lake, uh, Roma 2 is my mother's favorite now. I've been having a hard time finding some of the seeds for some of these things. My mother mailed me some Roma 2 bush beans this week in the mail. Mascotti, Maxibel, Crockett, and Bronco. Now, half runners, they've been around for a number of years, too. Mountaineer, Volunteer, White Pole Beans, Kentucky Blue, Kentucky Wonder, Seychelles, Lima Beans, Ford Hook, Henderson Bush, Dixie Butter Pea, and Edamames, or the Edible Soybeans, Envy, Midori Giant, and Sheba Green. Uh, if if you're trying to figure out uh, some of your new favorites, it's always good to try out a couple of, of varieties of beans or tomatoes or watermelons or whatever. I think we need to find a favorite in some of the things that, that grow well in our houses. So sometimes, when we, like I mentioned earlier, if I Google what's the best bush bean to grow, it may come from a university way up north and it may not really be well acclimated to, to my growing conditions in Tennessee. Kind of moving down the list, Corn is probably the second most planted seed, uh, warm season vegetable in the ground. But we do have three main branches of it, sweet, dent, and popcorn. Now, sweet is the one that we generally eat off the cob. Dent is like the one that you see in this picture right here. That's actually one called Neil's Paymaster, and I'll tell you the history of that in just a second. But it's usually used for corn meal, flour, and it's also used for animal feed. So when it, it's left on the plant, it dries on the plant, it becomes hard as a rock, and it's usually ground up for other things. Now, popcorn is also left on the plant until it actually dries, and then it's harvested that way. Corn is anywhere from one to two inches deep, four to six inches between rows, and corn is kind of unique. If you had one solid row of corn that was 50 feet long and you only had one row, you may have some pollination issues because corn is wind pollinated. So generally, we recommend planting corn in blocks. So if you, if you have enough corn to plant a 50-foot row, you may plant three 15-foot rows. That way, they're kind of all side by side because what happens at the top of the corn plant, it tossels, and then it drops the pollen, and it goes to the silk on the plant. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. And also corn, sequential plantings also help extend the harvest because sweet corns generally will come in all at one time. But what a lot of people will do because sweet corn is about a 70, 80, 90 day crop depending on the variety, they will plant some the middle of May, they'll plant some the middle of June, and they'll plant some usually the first or second week of July so they can extend their corn harvest and all their sweet corn is not coming in at one time so they can offset that 
just to kind of help extend the harvest. That way you're not having just all this corn in for a couple of weeks and then for the rest of the summer, you're having to eat frozen corn that you put up. So kind of talking about the tossling on corn, I mentioned it needs to kind of be side by side, but you'll see all the silks right there. They are going to collect all the pollen that's fallen from the tossels, and that's actually connected to each kernel on the cob. So each kernel has to be pollinated. So if you've grown sweet corn in the past, dent corn, some of the older varieties such as Trucker's Favorite, Hickory King, that Neil's Paymaster. Now this one is actually Neil's Paymaster right here. They're all dent corns. Neil's Paymaster was a unique history, historical type corn that was actually bred in Wilson County. And uh, you'll see his name used a lot around the Ag Center. And he's actually in the Tennessee Agriculture Museum uh, Hall of Fame because of his work of braiding corn. So William Haskell Neal had some white varieties of corn and he actually started selecting the ones out of the blocks of corn that he was growing that had two ears. So technically Neil's Paymaster was the first corn to really have two ears of corn on it. And that was right under a hundred years ago. And it was developed Wilson County, I think out toward Tucker's Crossroads. So famous corn developed right here in Wilson County. Looking at some of this other corn, sweet corn, there are so many great varieties. Now there are white varieties, there are yellow varieties, and there's bicolor varieties. So peaches and cream is probably the most common one. That's a bicolor yellow and white. Silver queen is the old fashioned yellow, or excuse me, white sweet corn. How sweet it is, golden queen, incredible, and honey select. And you can go anywhere to the, the, the stores and see a number of varieties of sweet corn. Now popcorn, they're a little bit different. Usually the kernels on the corn are a little bit smaller. Tom Thorn, Tom Thumb is a popular popcorn. And the one on the right is Glass Gem. And it was actually grown by Rosemary Marshall in our trial gardens at Fiddler's Grove. But it was probably the most beautiful corn I have ever seen in my life. But it's, it's not a sweet corn. It's not a dent corn. It's actually a popcorn. Cow peas, I don't think you get any more Southern than black eyed peas. And this is how I was raised. We had black eyed peas pretty much every meal, uh, usually from the middle of June on until uh, summertime, basically the end of summertime. But we call them Southern peas, cow peas, lady peas, black eyed peas. And I've got a lot of my grandfather's seeds. My grandfather has been passed away about 20 years. And my uncle gave me a lot of his collection of his cow peas. My grandfather was a huge cow pea person. So I've got all these seeds that I've been collecting from my uncles and I plan on planting those out this year to see how they grow. And you can kind of see in that picture, this little pill bottle that he gave me was from 1987. And that was, that's my grandfather's handwriting there. Now cow peas, they're kind of a half runner type. So, so some of them are vining. If you had them next to corn, they would be fine to run up the corn. If you had them next to a fence, they would run up the fence some. But for the most part, a lot of the older cow or cow peas, black eyed peas are, are bush form. So they really only get anywhere from 20 to 30 inches tall. And this is a good heat tolerant crop that prefers it to be on the dry side. So when we think about sometimes when we go through three or four weeks without any rain in the summertime, and some of the other vegetables can suffer a little bit, cow peas really do well. These black eyed peas do well. On general planting recommendations, anywhere from four to six feet, uh, six seeds per foot. Cucumbers are generally planted directly from seeds, but kind of keep in mind, some are vining and they can run up trellises and some are the bush form. And I wanted to mention this word because you may see this in seed catalogs now. It's called parthenocarpic. A parthenocarpic cucumber can put on fruit without pollination. So if you had an issue without, with pollination in the past, you didn't really have enough pollinators in the garden, cucumbers that are parthenocarpic will still set a lot of fruit without any pollinators. Where does this come in handy? This comes in handy in a lot of the greenhouse instances. So we see a lot of greenhouse cucumbers coming out hydroponically and they're grown all winter long and Generally, we don't have bees in these greenhouses where a lot of these cucumbers are grown. So they'll grow these parthenocarpic varieties so that they're actually setting all these fruit without any pollinators. And they'll also use uh, parthenocarpic cucumbers if you've got some issues in, with bugs and you're having to cover your crops sometimes with like a netting 
to keep bugs out to begin with, they'll still bear fruit without any pollinators under that net. And trellising may be an option on some of these bush or vining varieties of cucumbers. So kind of research it. So you'll see some, they'll actually have bush in the name. It'll say bush pickle or a straight eight doesn't have bush in the name. It's more of a vining type. So kind of research some of these. When we look at varieties of cucumbers that, that do really well in Tennessee, Dasher 2, Salad More, Fanfare, straight eight has been the go-to slicing cucumber probably for the last 80 years in Tennessee. Generally, Diva and Patio Snacker. So I wanted to also highlight, when you go to uthort.com, you can go on there and cl click Trial Data Information. So Dr. Bumgarner and Dr. Sykes at UT Knoxville have been doing this home garden variety trials with home citizen scientists, they call it. So they send you two varieties of a cucumber, two varieties of a corn, two varieties of a, of a muskmelon, and they want you to tell them which ones you like better. And I know some of you on this have participated in this, but kind of showing you, if you're looking up varieties of cucumbers to buy online, I would encourage you to go look at the trial data to see which ones have done good in the, in the performance. So like last year, she had two pickling cucumbers against each other. She had one called H19 Little Leaf, and one called Cool Customer. You can see right now that 67% recommend Cool Customer over H19 Little Leaf. And you can kind of see the little pie charts at the bottom, which ones had first fruit, Cool Customer had fruit better. It looked better, it was more attractive. It had a higher yield at, from Little Leaf. So I kind of want to mention that, go to that trial data. It's not just cucumbers, it's a lot of things that she's done over the past three or four or five years. I also wanted to mention one question that we get sometimes at the office is, I've got cucumbers and they have tons of flowers, but I have no fruit whatsoever. Most cucumbers that are not parthenocarpic will have two types of flowers. So most of the old ones, so if we talk about straight eight cucumbers, you have a male flower, which is the one on the left, and you have a female flower, which is the one on the right. You can tell the female flower because it has an immature fruit at the base of the flower. We call that the ovary. So the male flowers come on first and they come on hard because what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring in pollinators. So for a couple of weeks, you'll see all these beautiful yellow flowers all over the cucumbers, and you're like, I'm just not getting any fruit. You gotta give it time because all those male flowers open up a couple of weeks before the female flowers to bring in all the pollinators. So if, you're, if you have some small cucumbers outside and you're having flowers, you're probably more than likely just getting the male flowers. You're not getting any, any female flowers yet. But I wanted to show you the difference if you wanted to look at a male flower versus a female flower. And we also see this on a lot of other you know, cucurbit type crops, like pumpkins have male and female flowers, gourds have male and female flowers. It's not hard to see a female one always has that immature fruit at the base of the flower. Also look at disease resistance on some of these. And I will ask at the very end, I cannot remember the two varieties of this cucumber, but there were two different varieties here. A lot of the newer varieties of cucumbers are resistant to a couple of diseases. The main disease that cucumbers get now is called downy mildew. And it seems to blow up from the south every year with all of these storms. And you can see it will quickly decimate an entire cucumber crop. So the one on the left was more resistant to downy mildew as opposed to the one on the right, which was more susceptible to downy mildew. Just to show you, that was two varieties of cucumbers, one with disease resistance and one without. I kind of lumped all these together, all these melons, cucumbers, uh, honeydews, watermelons, they're, they're all kind of, they all grow the same. The spacing can be a little bit differently because these vines can run up to 10 feet, but on some watermelons, we see bush varieties also. There's a uh, sugar bush or something, a sugar baby bush or something like that now. That's, it's supposed to be a watermelon that has really short vines, but keep in mind, these vines can run up to 10 feet. So if you've got a really small planter box, or maybe you're trying to grow some of these in a container, or maybe in a really small raised bed, some of these melons may not be the best choice for that. There are bush cultivars, cultivars available. Make sure we've got proper placement in the garden. If you've got a smaller spot in the garden that holds water, 
it's probably not a good idea to place these things there because they're going to be more susceptible to diseases if they kind of sit in moist areas the whole time. Cantaloupes, watermelons, honeydews have some issues with disease anyways. And if we can kind of get a healthy plant underneath it, we're going to be able to help fend off some of those diseases later in the year. On cantaloupes, we've got a couple of varieties that we recommend, Athena, Ambrosia, Lampkin, and also Amy. Watermelons, some of the more standby ones called Sugar Baby, Starlight, Sorbet Swirl, Farmer's Wonderful, Mini Love, Crimson Sweet. And the one on the right is one I saw in Farmer's Market last year called Yellow Doll, and I thought it was so cool. It was kind of one of the small, mini, personal size watermelons. We've also got some personal size cantaloupes. So if you're a, a, a smaller person and you're a small family, and you don't want a whole lot of watermelons or cantaloupes to come in. Some of these stay smaller on cantaloupes. There is one called Sugar Cube. That's usually just about two pounds because some of these cantaloupes, we can, get, we can get them as large as 16, 18, 20 pounds. And watermelons, oh, you can get them up to 100 pounds. That's a whole lot of watermelon to eat at one time <laughs> for a small family. Okra. Okra is generally a good southern crop also, kind of along with cow peas. Two to four inches apart, a quarter of an inch deep. The one issue that we have with okra is the seeds are so hard, we have to scarify them sometimes before we actually plant them. So sometimes we'll have germination issues with them in the garden. So it's always a good practice for okra to soak them but not before you're gonna plant them. That way that'll help break that seed coat before you plant them. The number one standard okra that's been around since the 30s was Clemson Spineless. Even though it still has spines, it has spineless in the name. Developed by, you know, Clemson. It was an AAS winner in 1939, and it was basically the one that stood out the best that year. And what's great, is over the past 80 years now, it has still been one of the best okras. So we see some people knocking heirlooms, say, well, they're, they're not that great. We see some people who, who love heirlooms and say some of the hybrids don't do well. We need to have a balance because some, some varieties in the past just do better than some of the newer ones. This Clemson Spineless, an All-American Selection winner okra from 1939 is still the number one planted okra in the U.S. today, and it's an old one, 1939. I also wanted to show you, these are from my friend Rick. We've also got a lot of these interesting heirloom okras that have red fruit. Keep in mind, all these are in the hibiscus family, so the flowers are beautiful anyways, but look at the leaves. The texture on these leaves looks fantastic, so if you're trying to add a different effect to the garden or maybe even a tropical effect. Add some of these red ochre to the mix. Pumpkins, plant according to when you want to harvest. Now pumpkins can be anywhere from 90 to 120 days. Now the seed package should tell you. So if I plant my pumpkins the middle of April and I expect to have pumpkins for Halloween, that is way too early to plant pumpkins. So I need to kind of count back to when I want my pumpkins to be picked and go back. Generally, in Wilson County, it's, it's usually the first, second, or third week of June when most of the pumpkin farmers are actually planting their pumpkins. They don't plant them in May. They want them available in September and October. But we can plant them even as late as the first week of July and still get a great crop of pumpkins. Research the cultivar that you want because we have some that are just grown for ornamental uses. They don't have a lot of flesh. We have some that are considered pie pumpkins. Uh, we have some that are considered like the winter storage type pumpkins that will pretty much last all winter long. So kind of research them, some of these varieties. And uh, not every pumpkin probably can be eaten because some of them just don't have a lot of flesh in them. Some of the varieties that are recommended are Cargo, Racer Plus, Moonshine's a little white one, Baby Bear, Triangle, and Little Pumpkimon. And I think that one was in a trial here recently with UT, but I wanted to show you the, a lot of these pictures were from one of the local pumpkin producers in our county. And I just can't get over the diversity that he grows. The one on the right, that little faint yellow one, is a one called Mellow Yellow. My favorite vegetable to eat all summer is summer squash. 
it's a lot more compact than winter squash. And I'll talk about winter squash. So butternut squash, some of the acorn squashes, some of those can run quite a bit. Summer squash is more of a, of a bush type. We see varieties like zucchini as a summer squash, varieties like patty pans, varieties like the yellow squash. Usually two to three feet apart in the, in the, in the row and then five to feet, three to five feet between the rows. Average day of 50 days to harvest. Now, I think when we look at all the vegetables that we talked about today, I think this is the one that a lot of kids need to be growing because it's quick. They're able to see the plant grow fast. They're able to see it bloom. They're able to see it have set fruit. And out of the ones that we've talked about today, this one will probably have fruit anywhere from 45 to 50 days. So it's a really quick turnaround on summer squash in Tennessee. A couple of other varieties that are really great. I wanted to mention this one again. The one on the right is probably my favorite one called Tempest. And it's just kind of a, a crook neck yellow squash. The one on the left is called Lemon Squash. It's an old, old variety but it's more of a vining type. It's not really meant to be used in a pot. The vines can get like a pumpkin six or eight feet long. Uh, and then that's just some zucchini on the right. That's an heirloom variety called Coco Zell. Now winter squash is a little different. You have some vining, you have some bush, and we have a lot of varieties of winter squash that can last six or seven months. So why are they called winter squash? because these were the ones that colonists and settlers would actually grow in the summertime, and then they would have them stored in their root cellar. They would have them stored under their houses. They would last all winter long. These were the things they would eat. And I've heard people say, well, winter squash, this is the, the, the squash that we need to be planting in the wintertime. False, that's not, that's not right at all. Winter squash needs to be planted in the next couple of weeks, once we've kind of passed all these dangers of cool weather and frost. And then uh, Harvest Butternut, Acorn Hubbard, there's a lot of other ones. And then these are the ones that, that sit on our counter or in our storage cellar. I've got two butternut squash sitting on my counter from last October still. Just to kind of show you, this is what people ate, you know, 200 years ago that would last them all winter long. They needed some type of a sustenance. That picture right there is of acorn squash that I grew last year in the garden. But look at the fruit set on some of these new varieties of acorn squash. It's crazy how many acorn squash one plant will actually produce. Uh, this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe? That was just on one small plant. On the varieties of summer squash versus winter squash, some of the varieties of summer squash that are recommended are Raven, Spineless Perfection, Tigress, Sunburst, Multipick. The last two, Zephyr and Tempest, have been in the trials for UT a couple of times. That one on the right is Tempest. Zephyr is one that's half green, half yellow. We see it pushed a lot at farmer's markets because it's a beautiful yellow squash. Some of the varieties of winter squash that do really well, Butterscotch, Sunshine, Waltham, Bonbon, Honey Bear, and Honey Nut. And we had acorn squash in the trials, the UT Hort trials last year. Oh, how many of you have ever grown squash before? Um, if you've grown squash in Tennessee, you're going to have a couple of issues with squash beetles, squash borers, squash beetles, squash borers or vine borer. These are basically squash bugs. So you can kind of see on the left, that is the eggs on the leaf. And on the right is the adult squash bug. It's easiest to go through on the leaf. When you see these really small eggs, to just rip them off, go throw them in your trash can, crush them, burn them, just get rid of them. That will really help out. But there are insecticides that you can use also if you need to. Esfenvalerate and also permethrins. And look for the active ingredients uh, on some of these. And also read and follow the labels on all these insecticides if you're having a lot of huge issues with these. It's also best if you've got a, like a lot of raised beds in your garden, you may put two or three squash on one far side, wait 30 days, and then go to the other side of your raised bed garden and plant two more. It also helps out if you just kind of sequential plant. So you may plant some every 30 or 40 days just to kind of keep the harvest going. And once one plant gets really down with the squash bugs, just go through, get rid of it and kind of get rid of all those eggs that are on it and then let the other ones uh, go. Just let them kind of put on the harvest. You may just 
kind of do some se sequential plantings. And that's typically what I do on my squash. I usually plant it every 30 or 40 days just to kind of help extend the harvest. All right, I have finished things up. If you are looking for answers to some of your gardening questions, your family and consumer science questions, your agriculture questions, your 4-H questions, I want to encourage you to go to this website, which is utextension.tennessee.edu. Extension is working at this time. So when you go to that website, you scroll to the bottom right, and it says find your county office. You can click on that, find your county map, and you can find all their numbers, all their email addresses, and what programs that are offered in your county. I'm going to hit stop record now.